Well, hello, lovely listeners. Uh, today, I've got the great honor of speaking with Ben Winter. Ben is an author. Um, he has a book called What to Expect When Having Expectations, uh, as well as several other books, I believe, uh, which I'm sure he'll talk to us about. Um, ben is a speaker, actor, improvist, never can say that word, entrepreneur, traveler, father, and a lot more. And he loves to explore physical places, but also he loves to explore the mind. Um, I think Ben's pretty much a seasoned uh, podcast interviewee. So uh, I'm really looking forward to this one. So welcome, Ben. It's great to have you here. And it's only 5.30 in the morning where you are. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> and yes, it is quite early here. <laughs> <laughs> you are you are tenacious, I'll give you that. Um, and, and you did say improvist just fine. So oh, did I? Uh, okay, yes. right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so um, my my podcasts are pretty informal, but I love to know the backstory to all my guests um, because, as you know, this is called the Never Settle podcast, and I love it. You know, when people are on one tra tra trajectory, if I can say it, um, and then something changes, something happens that makes them think differently and, and makes them want something different. So. So yeah, so over to you, really. Can you give us a little bit of a backstory as to who Ben is? Yeah, uh, wow, there's so many pieces here and so many, so many changes over life. So the first biggest one, I think, really was after college. So I didn't have a whole lot of self-esteem growing up. I didn't have, a, I would say, a lot of friends. I didn't date. Like, it was just a very pathetic situation. Um, when you look at it from the outside you're like oh this poor guy like there ain't right. everybody's all sad about it including myself uh, but I started doing personal growth work and uh, like in the early 2000s and really just what the, changed everything around me and I started to find my self-confidence figure out what self-confidence is and really kind of grow that and then as a result of that I met my soon-to-be future ex-wife. <laughs> it's like it's, I get it. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to succinctly say that because I've done it so much. It's like I think that that sums it up. Yeah. Um, she decided she wanted to take an improv class, and I had always thought about it, but never thought I was good enough to do so. And so I went with her. So there's, I got up on stage, and learned these rules of improv and it was just the most magical thing that's ever happened to me I, I absolutely fell in love with it and so personal growth was a change doing an improv class was a huge change and then having you know then we got married so I mean that's marriage is always a pivotal change in life um, but we got pregnant and she said shortly after he was born, he's like, you really don't like your job. You should quit. We have this money saved up. Let's move to Europe. And right, like, so brand new baby. Like, I think when she said that he was two months old. And I was like, uh, what? <laughs> like, it didn't make any sense. Uh, fast forward of four months. And here we are selling off everything and leaving the country. So we left the States for Europe with no agenda, no idea where we were going, how long we were going to be there with a six month old child in our hands. And so that was biggest change I think I've ever done in my life. Is she life. a good salesperson, Ben? <laughs> a good what? Salesperson. Yeah, she is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you know, who doesn't want to just pick up and go someplace for a long period of time? <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. But most people don't, <laughs> most people don't have the balls to do it, do they? So um, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> So we got back from our trip. It ended up being about three months. And I didn't want to go back to a corporate job, which is what I was previously doing. And so I started my own business. So that's a nice pivot right there. What were, <laughs> and, you, what were you doing then? So when I came back, I took kind of my hobby of website and graphic design and turned it into a business. So that was what I, I started doing for, for many, many years. and. I still was doing improv. I had this business. I was been doing personal growth and I started doing a lot of spiritual work because I had now got a divorce. <laughs> 
and I was kind of going through a dark period of my life with a divorce. I was not like, it really hit me kind of hard uh, because I was not expecting to ever get divorced. It's not what I grew up experiencing. My parents are about to celebrate their 50th wedding anniversary next year. So, uh, so for me, a divorce was like, it was unknown territory. And anyway, so I, between the personal growth, the business, the spiritual, the improv, everything sort of came together. And I decided I needed to teach improv, not just for people to get up on stage, but to teach them how to use it on, in an everyday life experience. And so here I am creating a brand new business, teaching improv for team building and, and other stuff like that. And and then it's huge because I absolutely love getting up in front of the room for one. And then I absolutely love teaching people. And when I get to teach people what I love to do, that I'm not working anymore. Right. I'm just having a lot of fun. Can, can I ask you about improv? Because uh, yeah. I know a couple of people that have sort of gone down that line and, and got themselves out of their comfort zone. That's, that's been what it's all about. It, it fills me with dread. I think one of the hardest jobs in the world must be stand-up comedian, you know, being a stand-up comedian, because to have everybody just staring at you, waiting to laugh, must be like, ugh. I mean, I know it's natural to them, but you you went from being a very uh, insecure and sort of, as you called it, sad existence when you were younger, to all of a sudden throwing yourself into improv. How the hell did you do that? And And... And why? What, what was it about improv? And if, because I, I sort of get it. I think I know what it is, but I've never done it. And I'm scared, you know, I'm fairly, people would think I'm fairly confident, but that fills me with dread. So, sure. Well, let, let's about? first, well, let's first clarify it. So, improv and stand up are completely different animals and two okay. different beasts. So, if you've seen the show Whose Line Is It Anyway on TV, yeah. That's improv. That's where a group of people get together and they create something from nothing. Uh, there are stand-up comedians that can do that. Robin Williams was probably the best improv stand-up comic there was. Like he just could go in places nobody understood, uh, which is why he was as, as successful as he was. Mm. So I'm more of the improv troop kind of uh, comedy if you will and it doesn't always have to be funny but it typically ends up being funny and the reason is is that life is funny uh and the way that i equate improv and everything is that all we do every moment of every day of our lives is improvised nobody ever wakes up with a script and anybody who's ever acted in anything knows that the script doesn't always follow directly like somebody always messes something up and you've just got to make do with what happens and what I didn't know when I first took an improv class was that there are rules to improv. And that's what really yeah. kind of sunk, uh, sunk it, um, made it work for me was here. I am somebody who likes rules. I, I'm pretty good at following rules. And somebody says, here are rules to improv. You follow them and you're, you're just going to be fine. And I was like, I can follow rules. Let's talk about these things. And they're so simple. They're th and very impactful. So once you know the rules and you can follow them on a regular basis, everything's just more fun. Life is more fun because I have Im improv as a skill and, and I understand it and I know how it works. So that's why I teach it because it makes it easier for people to understand how the world works, how to interact with other people and everything just works better. And so I'm an advocate, 100%. Everybody should take an improv class. It doesn't mean you have to get up on stage. It means you're learning how to do improv. Uh, and if if life is improv, if you learn the rules, then you're going to be successful, which, by the way, is a tagline for my, my first book. <laughs> so but, quick, uh, a quick question yeah. on that. Um, I OK, so there are. If I use myself as an example, like I, I prior to um, becoming a coach and doing this podcast, I was in sales, corporate sales for a long, long time. <clears throat> and in that environment you have to um obviously improvise you have to think on your feet and all the rest of it um you also have to mirror people you know there are unwritten rules there are there is also your gut instinct and I very much lead with my gut instinct you know whatever fit whatever I feel in that moment and and I will 
say what I say in that moment and some people will go you know because I can be quite direct not not in an aggressive way but just you know I don't like bullshit you may as well just just cut to the bottom line what you know let's talk about it and I can get away with it I guess because of the way I deliver it or whatever but I sort of I, I don't think about rules I'm thinking about what it feels like you know I am very spiritual like like yourself and and that's so I'm not thinking about rules like I am not a rule follower I'm the complete opposite so again that sort of rule rule thing and I'm a I'm a right brainer not a left brainer I don't know you might have you might have both going on there um so so I suppose what I'm asking is and I know there are people that don't um do so well in certain situations and they can't think on their feet and they don't speak what they want to speak and, and all the rest of it whereas I sort of don't haven't really struggled with that in so improv good instinct I suppose is what I'm saying what what's your thoughts on that you in a in a sense you are following the rules of improv because they're not like your typical you know don't go don't go on the wrong direction on a one-way street like that's a very dead set rule yeah so the most common rule of improv that people have heard because i'll when i say the rules of improv they're like yes and i was like yes the the rule of yes and is one of the biggest rules of improv what's that what what that equates to is the word yes and yes and is accepting what is in the moment so if you're in a sales meeting or whatever or you're coaching somebody and they say something really really stupid you're like that is not going to serve you that's wrong information etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, it's clearly just wrong in every way possible you don't sit there and just well your first thing is you have to accept they just said that that is something they believe right you have to accept what's happening in the moment the word and in yes and is now you have to add on to the moments in a, a way that works so whether that's an intuitive reaction um, you're following the, the i accept that they said this even though they're wrong and now i have to provide enough information so that they understand themselves that they're wrong not you know we have this weird thing in society where nobody wants to be wrong so if yeah. you tell somebody that they're wrong they're going to fight you but yeah. if you say well okay i hear what you're saying um have you thought about xyz do you know about this information do you have that piece of knowledge and they're like oh no i didn't think about that now they're going to come up with that they're wrong on their own no big deal they'll get past it uh, and that's the beauty of of that particular rule is it's not about making people wrong it's about providing information and understanding where somebody's coming from uh, the other piece which i think ties into your intuitiveness is focus on the present as another rule of improv if you're listening to what somebody's saying, if you're here and now, if you're feeling the person, what they're saying, and the underlying tones of what they're saying, you are literally following the rule of focus on the present. Mm -hmm. And because of that, not only are you focused on them and the situation, you're focused on your here and now, which is your intuition. And it's going to come out and say what it needs to say, right? So in a sense, just those two rules alone, you are following the rules of improv when you're doing these things and you're being blunt and to the point, because it's not that you're, you know, somebody saying something and you're sitting here on your phone going, huh, what was that? Yeah. You know, that, that's, that doesn't work for anybody. That doesn't work in dating and relationships anywhere. You have to be here and now talking with the person to really communicate well. So, so I think you are following the rules of improv. You just don't realize that you are. <laughs> <laughs> but again it's how you see it isn't it because you're seeing it as rules and i'm seeing it as it it is what it is you know what i mean exactly yeah. yeah and i think the key to understanding is a lot of people follow the rules of improv without even realizing but there's plenty of people out there who are in complete denial of their situation in life so nothing's ever going to improve you know if you're sitting there saying like i don't have the money i want well better get up have my coffee and go to work well, is that serving you to get the money you want? Or do you need to go find a new job? Or do you need to create a new job? You know, do you have to do something different to now have the income that you want? Right? It's not doing the same thing over and over isn't going to change your salary. It's not going to change how much money you make. 
you have to do something different. So as soon as you can accept, I don't have the money I want. I don't have the relationship I want. I don't have the living situation I want. Once you can accept where you are, then you can move somewhere. Uh, any, any coach will say, you have to know your point A to get to point B. Otherwise, you're going to go in the wrong direction. Uh, and that's, that's all just part of the whole program. It's part of the improv. It's part of the understanding and acceptance of where you are. So, so how for some you, people. Sorry. So, so how did you move? So you were doing web design and, and graphics and stuff. And then, um, then you moved into what you're doing now. So how, what was that transition and, and why did that happen? I was meditating one day and it was just kind of like this boom here's what you're here's where you're going here's what you're doing and I was like okay <laughs> sounds good to me like it just it was just that weird moment of here's your calling and, and go for it uh and so I, I started that business now you know they were kind of I was doing this business and that business and um you know, it wasn't just like a quick, like I'm quitting my old business and starting a new one. Um, I had enough experience in business to know like that's not, you don't know, just start a new business and you're successful one day, like you have to build it. So yeah. that's kind of the process there. And, but you know, that's, that's not it because here I am teaching improv and there's a rule of improv that I teach called be specific, which is where we use our words and our communication tools you know hands and inflection and everything else to let people know what we want and the example i always use is if two people walk out on stage so i always use stage improv as a way to get people to to recognize what's happening but if two guys walk out on stage and one says hi mom how are you the whole yes and comes in of i have to accept that i'm mom and add to the scene Okay, so it's the yes and and, and that whole thing. So if that person comes out and doesn't say, okay, yeah, I'm mom. And what do I need to go from here? If they deny that they're mom, well, the scene falls apart. It's not believable. Nobody's having fun. Everybody's confused. But if they say, don't hi, mommy, you spilled paint in the garage. Well, they accepted that they're mom. They're upset with the child because the other person basically made themselves a child at that point. And they added to the scene by saying, you spilled paint in the garage and I'm upset about it, right? So they did the yes and. Now the other person has to do the yes and and say, okay, I spilled paint in the garage and mom's upset. So now, you know, what's my excuse for pilling, spilling paint in the garage, etc. You can see this scene will now grow and continue. And the whole point there is that it wasn't that the person came out and said, hey, how are you? And the other person's like, I guess I'm fine but nobody knows who's who the whole be specific comes in of hi mom how are you don't hi mom me you spilled paint in the garage there's more specific information being added so that's on stage you know take take an example from living with somebody you know hey honey can you take out the trash okay we all think that's pretty straightforward but which trash when do you need it taken out is there a reason it needs to be done right now there's a lot of specifics around a request as simple as, can you take out the trash? Um, also, what are you doing? And do you need time to finish up what you're doing before you take out the trash, right? There's, there's back and forth that happens with be specific. It's really called communicating, <laughs> which a lot of people suck at these days. <laughs> Even though we can text and email and everything else, people aren't as good at communicating as they used to be. Another way to look at being specific is setting expectations, setting boundaries, and all of that sort of thing. So as I was teaching this, I kept coming across a saying that, or it's something I just kept saying, which is the only reason anybody gets upset is because an expectation hasn't been met. And so here I am going, does that work in every situation that I can think of? And I, I played with it. And I, I've yet to find a situation where if you're upset about something, there's not some expectation on the other side of that equation that was unmet. Mm. And it didn't solve anything, though. It was great. It was like, I'm onto something, but it didn't solve anything. And so that's where the book that you mentioned at the beginning, What to Expect When Having Expectations, came to light. 
um, I took the moment in time of being upset and I created a workflow. So I went very right brain on this one. And I figured out, you know, you can go from being upset, figuring out what your expectation is. Have you shared it? Is it reasonable? A lot of questions to ask yourself around expectations to get to a point of finding peace through through that moment of being upset. Because being upset is a great trigger point if you use it to your advantage, because it's an opportunity to say, hey, I'm upset. I had an expectation. I probably didn't know I had that expectation until this very moment. And you can learn a lot about yourself by exploring the expectations that start staring you in the face. And there were a lot of no's in that. Like, have you shared your expectation? No, I haven't shared my expectation. Why haven't you shared that expectation? There's a lot of fear behind sharing our expectations with setting boundaries with people, because what if they freak out? What if they run away? What if they're not going to buy into those, right? There's, there's a lot of fear there. And so that's why the book was created was really to fill in all these blanks around all the, the no's and just the general workflow itself. I said, there's a lot more information here. So I got to, got to write this book. And do you, know, you give, do you give, um, just on the expectations, because I'm thinking about a, a, something that's very prevalent in my life right now. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what's the, it's all very well having the awareness of, right, so I've got these expectations and therefore I'm now disappointed because those expectations were not met. And this is creating, um, you know, some kind of unrest or disappointment in my system you still want to communicate that to the other person because if you don't, that's festering away. So what's, what's the, what, I haven't read your book, so I'm interested to know, do you basically say, right, yeah, so you have this awareness and these expectations, et cetera, et cetera, and by the way, this is how you deal with it. This is a solution. In a manner of speaking, yes. It, it, at the end of the day, it's a practice. Mm -hmm. uh, awareness. Awareness training, personal growth, it's all a practice. The more you become aware of what runs you and the thoughts behind your, your, your eyes, if you will, the more you can understand why you have these thoughts and, and what you can do with them. And until you're aware, again, accepting what is happening, you're not really able to change anything. Expectations and being upset is a great trigger point to learn about yourself. And yeah, at some point you have to get to the point of, I need to share this expectation with the other person. Now, I always ask first, you know, is your expectation reasonable? If you believe it's reasonable and you have good reason to think it's reasonable, then why not share it with the other person? But you have to keep in mind when you share your expectation, just because you share it doesn't mean they're going to buy into it. You know, they have their own thoughts and expectations as well. So once you share your expectation, you also want to ask them what their expectations are. Don't wait for them to share theirs because it's not, it's not normal for us to share our expectations for some reason. Now, some people are very good at it. Other people aren't good at setting expectations. And I, and I can use the word boundaries interchangeably. You know, a lot of people are like, well, I, I don't tell people no when I should. Mm. Well, that's telling somebody no is an expectation of like, you're crossing a line here. Don't do that. Um, I have an expectation that you respect my space and my boundaries and all this other stuff. Uh, and so if you don't share the expectation, you literally have no reason to be upset with the other person because they don't know. Yeah. They don't know. And that's, that's part of the thing that I, I talk about is if, if you don't share your expectation, get over yourself <laughs> because they don't know. <laughs> So you can't be upset with them for something they don't know you even have a thought about. And so you have to share it before you can even find out if they're willing to buy into it. And then if they do buy into it and then they still let you get, let you down, then there's some other expectation behind the scenes. Cause it's not, here's an expectation. Here's an expectation. It's like, here's an expectation intermingled with 16 other expectations that I didn't know were all mixed together. And it it's layers like an onion. It's, it's not like, here's a layer, here's a layer. They, they sort of intermix with each other. Uh, they're, they're connected, if you will. So 
just because you find out you have one expectation and you share it and you get buy-in doesn't mean that solves all the problems because there's usually something else that somebody didn't think about until a certain point. Um, so it's as a practice, the more you realize you have these expectations, the faster you will catch on to them. And the sooner you catch on to them, the less you'll be upset. And in fact, it actually switches to you catching your expectations before getting upset. And that's when you're having a lot more fun and a lot less time being sad or depressed or whatever it might be. Uh, and wouldn't we all want to be happier more often? Oh, I, yeah. I think so. Absolutely. And you're dead right in terms of the intermingling, right? So this particular scenario I'm thinking of at the moment, there's, there's a lot of intermingling. Um, and I try and live by the rule, would you rather be right or would you rather be happy? Well, I'd rather be happy, right? And put the ego to one side. However, <laughs> every so often that ego wants to be right. And I, I don't know whether you want to answer this, whether we want to go there, but I was just thinking, because this intermingling is, is made even more extreme, I think, um, in the last 18 months, two years, in terms of the polarization that's happening in the world. And it's not just about, oh, you know, they didn't turn up to this event because of that, because in your mind you're thinking, but is it also because of that, that and that, you know, because of all the, the uh, limitations, all of the opposing beliefs that people have got in the world today in terms of health, uh, you know, and, and distance, social distancing and all that sort of stuff. So I don't really know what my question is. I think, while, <laughs> I think while you were talking, I was thinking about all of these things. And how does that now, like, I don't know when you wrote that book. Was it pre-pandemic? It was. Yeah. And, and how, have, how has it changed, if it has changed at all, for you and the people that you teach and, and, and interact with now in, in the way we're living right now? It really doesn't change anything other than make it more obvious. <laughs> um, we do live in a polarized world, and I go back to the whole statement of nobody wants to be wrong. Mm. And, you know, here in the States, we have Democrats and Republicans, and neither side wants to give in and mm. say, yeah, we were wrong about something, right? And both sides are wrong about stuff all the time. Like, it's not, this is politics. Everybody's wrong about something. Um because they're playing a stupid game of can I get elected again yeah it's not about the people anymore but but here we are with people and messaging out there social media and tv and all this other stuff saying this is the truth well no this is the truth no this is the truth and and for 18 months they've been doubling down on their truths whether they're right or wrong is is irrelevant at this point it's that they're so bought into whatever they believe the truth is that they're going to continually find quote unquote evidence to prove so. And it's detrimental in our society because there are so many people that don't believe COVID's a thing. You know, like we've got 5 million people out there dead around the world and it's not a thing. I'm like, I'm sorry, the evidence is just staring you in the face. So if you don't want to believe it, then you're, you're choosing not to, you're choosing to continually believe that you're right rather than the happiness thing. And, and I'm not saying like, here's the real, real, real truth. And by believing the real truth, you're happy. It's you're so dead set on what you believed at one point that you're not willing to change your mind based on new evidence. And that's causing you grief and pain and suffering. I am, I, I do like to be right. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to lie about it. I am willing to say that I'm wrong when I am. If I am given new evidence, I'll say, my bad, I was wrong. You're, you're right. Let's move on. Like it really doesn't take much effort to say that you're wrong and move on. In fact, a lot of people respect that because they're like, oh, this person actually listens uh, they they look at information, they're willing to grow and change. And that's what growth is. Growth is figuring out that didn't work. That wasn't effective. That didn't help me. I was wrong about this 
this information, now I have new information and I can do and be and have more as a result. And I think that's where people get confused is that if they admit that they're wrong, they think that everything's going to go to crap and their life's over. Like being wrong is some detrimental thing. It's the exact opposite. It's, it's, and I'm not saying go out and find everything that's wrong, but when you find out something's wrong, you can grow from there. You're not going to decay from there. You're going to grow. And that's healthy. That's happiness. So I think people need to start accepting that when new information comes along that they were wrong about before to admit it, move on. <laughs> You'll be happier as a result because otherwise you're just going to be those people that show up on videos fighting everybody because you just don't want to be wrong. And now you're the, the butt of everybody's joke. You're a meme and nobody likes you because you're this person on a video that's throwing a, a temper tantrum in the supermarket. So <laughs> where you could have just admitted you were wrong and everybody's happy and on with their day. <laughs> so who do you, um, when you sort of wanted to start this line of work um, and like you said, it's, it's not even work for you, you know, it's something that you love and it's something that's obvious. Who do you sort of uh, target? You know, do you have an ideal client or where, where, how do people get attracted to you? I know obviously you've got your books. Yeah. So the books I think are more, the, the books and the podcast interviews are more for the individual that wants to do something, but they don't know where to start. And I think that my messaging, whether it's my first book, which is Living Unscripted, which is about the rules of improv and how they apply to life or the expectations book, it gives them something to start with. And obviously with anything personal growth related, the more you read it, the more you explore it, the more you learn about it, the more depth there really is to each of those books. Um, so first time reading it, you're going to get a, a bunch of stuff. And then like the 10th time you're like, Jesus just keeps going deeper and deeper into a rabbit hole. And the, the classes that I teach are more for like groups and I'm going to say corporations that say, they say we want some better team building you know, going out to the pub is not like the best team building activity out there because um, you have those people that just like to drink to excess and the other people that just don't like drinking and don't like giant social settings. And so it's more divisive than it is a, a team building activity. Um, so that's that's kind of and that's that business is called Success Improv. And that's really for team building in, in corporate settings. Uh, but you know, every now and then I'll put together a class for individuals and we'll, we'll do a class with 20 random, 30 random people that don't know each other. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So how would you say your life is different from the corporate world into the website world, into the world you're now living? Obviously you, you married, you divorced. Um, are you married again? No, no, I don't, I don't think I ever want to, because uh, here in the States, the only benefit is some tax thing, yeah. all, all the headaches that come with it, uh, if you, if it doesn't work out. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I, it's easy enough to commit to somebody and say, you know, we're going to be committed to each other. Don't worry about the piece of paper that the government wants us to have to do some crazy stuff to us, but whatever. So <laughs> totally agree. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, lesson learned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. lesson well, learned. when when we're younger, because I, I was exactly the same. I got divorced a few years ago, and uh, yeah, it's not pretty. And you know, and all of those expectations are playing out like tenfold at that point. Um, and um, yeah, I, I've said exactly the same. Like I'm, I'm in a great relationship now, and we've both. And he's been married before, and I've I've said I'm not interested in getting married again. It, it's but you kind of feel like you want to make that commitment to each other, but it doesn't, like you said, it doesn't need to be a government piece of paper. That's a load of crap. You can, exactly. we, we've talked about having our own little ceremony somewhere. It doesn't, you know, it's not official. It's nothing like that, but it, it's, a, it's the symbolism of wanting to be together. So, um, so yeah, I totally get that. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately here uh, in, in, so I'm in the state of Colorado, we have this thing called common law marriage. So if we did a ceremony 
and wore rings and called each other well whether we called each other or not if people assumed and called us husband and wife um by law we would be common law married and would have to go through the same divorce procedures had we signed a, a legal document it's so stupid um wow two people can't just be committed together and live together with just as boyfriend to girlfriend um it's it's weird it's so stupid <laughs> so it's like you you keep your house i'll keep my house then legally we can never be common law married <laughs> <laughs> Um, sorry, I digress from the question. So in terms of, <laughs> in terms of, you know, where you were corporate life and you went to your own business and now you're doing this, um, how is life different for you personally? Oh my God. It's so, it's so much better. Uh, even though it's more stressful, it's also less stressful. And the reason I say that is that every day I'm out there interviewing for a new job. Because once I finish a class or, or finish a project, whatever it might be, I now have to go find the next one. I have to go be the salesperson. And, and I haven't reached that point where it's just the sales are coming in through yeah. Google result, results or whatever it might be yet. Um, so I'm always out working and finding a new job every day. <laughs> uh, and, and people don't understand that if you're going to start a business, that's kind of what happens is you're not just sitting at a desk collecting a paycheck doing a job because somewhere in that organization, somebody's out selling the product so that you do have a job to do. Mm. Uh, if you have your own business, you're selling and doing the job. And there's a lot of stress to that. However, there's a lot of freedom because I can pretty much wake up whenever I want. Uh, I can go into the office whenever I want. I can work when I'm productive and play when I'm not. Uh, that was one of the things in my corporate world that never worked for me because I was an early bird. I would go to work. I would get two hours of work done before most people would walk through the door. And that's a lot of productivity. If you've ever been in a corporate world where people are constantly like having meetings and sending emails, two hours of uninterrupted work is pretty much the entire day yeah. for some people. And I still had to stay at the office until everybody else left as well. So I was actually being um, punished for being productive in the morning rather than, oh yeah, you can come in two hours early and leave two hours early because you're productive in the morning and not in the afternoon. Oh, and you also have a cell phone and a computer at home. So you're clearly able to do something if an emergency arises. That never came into people's thoughts. And I was at a software company. And I, one thing I know about developers is they're night owls. They, they code at like 2 a.m. in the morning. But here they are having to come in at 8, 9 in the morning mm. and code. And I'm like, they're not productive at that time. Let them code in the middle of the night. <laughs> Let them code when there's not going to be meetings and interruptions and emails, right? It's there was there was a disconnect there of not letting people be productive when they're productive and i i think there's some companies out there that are catching on but it, unfortunately it's too common of the the eight to five or nine to five or whatever it is work day it's like that's not really how people work so as an entrepreneur i i can be productive in the morning i can do everything that i need to do and then I can go out and socialize because I'm better at the socialization in the afternoon and evening because uh, I don't, it's a different part of the brain. And I don't feel like I have to be productive for the, the tasky work, if you will. Uh, so I get to segment my day how I want to, which is great. And it's, it's so much more fun. And every time that I'm out having coffee with somebody, talking to them and, and learning about them and their business and vice versa, I'm just like I could not do this at a corporate job mm. right and so it's there's a lot of freedom to it um, but with that freedom comes a price of yeah you got to work a little bit harder some days yeah yeah I totally get it it's the same for me you know it, it's it's frustrating because you have to be a, a master marketer or, or a master salesperson as well as doing the job that you want to you know doing the thing that makes you passionate you know um but that, that is the reality. That is the reality of starting your own business and not being able to pay people to do that sort of stuff. You've got to do it all yourself. 
Um, so, so I suppose in a nutshell, then it's great, but it's hard. It's it's great freedom, hard. There's a bit more stress on your shoulders because obviously you're responsible for everything. Yeah, and it's it's not for everybody, and it, it's weird because if you live in this world of entrepreneurialism. You're like everybody can do this it's it's it takes some work but everybody can do it and there are some people that just can't they yeah. they're they're mentally not able to get past the different paychecks every week or every month <laughs> you know they like i want the constant steady stream of money <laughs> And, and they don't want to deal with the stress of, well, am I going to have enough this month or am I going to have so much that I can actually put some in savings for a change, right? <laughs> and and that's how it goes. You, you plan on the smaller months and when you get the bigger months, you put some away um, for those months where you don't quite meet that minimum. <laughs> so. So the work you do seem, sounds like it's mainly with corporates in terms of the team building and that sort of thing. Yes. Um, so just if we've got any listeners that, you know, are really intrigued to know more about what you do and how it might help them, how, how do you just target any sort of corporate business or do you have a certain thing that you think works better than, than others? No, it's for me, it's any group that wants to be more cohesive and have better communication and work better together um, and to have more fun in the workplace. So uh, that could be white collar, blue collar. It doesn't matter. Uh, it It's amazing watching people who don't think they can do anything to having a real, a lot of fun at the end of the day. So uh, it really doesn't matter what the industry is. The, the basic premise is we live a life of improv and that's absolutely everybody that lives a life of improv. So there's not a person on this planet that wouldn't benefit from understanding how improv works, what those rules are and how they apply. So yeah, it really doesn't matter. Um, and if somebody wanted to know more and find out more about you, where do they go? So for that business, it would be successimprov.com. Um, but for like the having expectations book, I would go to havingexpectations.com. Okay, cool. Well, I'll put that in the show notes anyway, so people can easily find it and put a link to that. Um, and I normally finish these conversations with any pearls of wisdom to the listeners out there that you might want to share. Yeah, so I'm going to share one final pivot here. Yeah. Um, I'm still doing what I'm doing, but about nine months ago, maybe a year now, I had an idea that I wanted to write my first sci-fi novel. Ah. and I'm almost done. I'm, I've am i got a writer's group that I started and they, they've been kind of digesting my book because I've more or less finished the first draft. And uh, yeah, so that's that's new. Um, hopefully being, being released first of next year. So, um, but the pearl of wisdom with that is if you have an idea to do something, just start. Don't wait for everything to be right. Don't wait for the weather to be perfect. Just go and start it. Go do something. If you have an idea for a book, do it. And, and the one thing that I can absolutely certainly say to that is that if I were to die tomorrow, I'd be perfectly okay with it because I got my words out on paper. There are books out in the world that have my name on it, my, my words. That will live on. I have left a legacy if if it's small, if it takes a hundred years before people catch on to it being an amazing book, whatever. But I got it done. I put it out there. I created something for this world. Uh, so if you have an idea to do something, go do it. You don't know how much time you have and you'll there'll be this amazing sense of like accomplishment that you probably will never quite understand unless you do it. Whether that's starting a business, whether that's writing a book or painting a painting, acting in a play, whatever, just go do what it is you think you want to do. Yeah. Because you won't know unless you try it. Perfect. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I, while you were talking about the science fiction, I was just, uh, <laughs> I was looking up um, 
so a couple of weeks ago I had a, he's actually an Air Force pilot, his name is Nick Nabatovsky, and um, he's published his first sci-fi novel. Um, so he's done uh, uh, more real writing, um, that's not that's not the right phrase, but you know what I mean. <laughs> um, and and he's done a bit of speaking, and uh, he's still in the air force. But he's um, yeah, so he's uh, published his first sci-fi novel this month. Um, so you should check that out because you and he's on uh, Matchmaker FM as well. Um, okay. might, might be a good guy for you to have you know communication with. Um, yeah, for sure. Really nice guy. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. Well, thank you so much, Ben. It's been an absolute pleasure. I've really enjoyed your your logic and the way that you formulated <laughs> this. Um, because I'm more of a you know free spirit, whatever, but but the way you talk um makes perfect sense. And and the expectations is we all know, you know, that we've got these expectations deep down, but it's acknowledging that, you know, I I can think of lots of people in my life that have higher expectations. Some might, some people might say I've got high expectations and maybe I do at times. I try not to, um, but sometimes it happens. Um, but I, I think the awareness of that and the acknowledgement of that and, you know, for people listening to, to read your book, I think would be a massive, um, a massive eye opener and a massive grounding to really, like you said, it opens up more, then it opens up more, then it opens up more. So um, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for being on. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Thank you.